So thanks everyone for, for joining today. My name is Gareth Young. I'm the founder and chief architect of Leva Cloud LLC. Um, we are a, a Microsoft security and compliance partner. We focus on all of the device management, security and compliance tools across Microsoft 365. Um, we're based out of both Atlanta, Georgia and Rochester, New York. And um, my colleague Tony Coughlin is actually in the room with some of the team there today. So we're, we're excited for you to have us and excited to be here. And yeah, let's jump in. So today we're going to be talking about the, the benefits of Microsoft Intune over SCCM or MECM. I prefer the old name. It's kind of stuck with me. <laughs> let's jump in here. So these are the, the topics that we're going to cover today. And I'm also going to include a, a bit of a demo. I know we started late though, so I'll be kind of mindful of, of time as we start to go through that. So let's jump in. Now, the first place I'd like to start is by talking about the, the evolution of device management. So you can't deny the statistics. The, the way that we work today looks very different to 10 years ago. Unfortunately, working outside of the traditional network perimeter it introduces new challenges, right, in the form of security. Threat actors are always looking for ways to compromise an organization. And whilst a large part of this presentation is about device management, we have to kind of go into that conversation with a lens to making sure that we put security at the forefront of whatever we do. Legacy device management tools like MECM can't really support the evolving world of hybrid work independently. We really need to evolve our approach to device management. Microsoft's investing a, a lot of money into the software applications and services to enable you to more easily and with less cost, modernize your device management and also increase its security posture as well. Let's let's just take a little moment here to understand Microsoft's current strategy around device management. So you might be using some legacy imaging solutions today, such as you know, touching each device with a USB stick or you know, using a, a, a PXE boot over the network. These approaches are, are outdated now, and for the most part, they're, they're pretty time consuming. We're gonna be talking about some new capabilities today that will reduce the time it takes you to get devices up and running. Um, and honestly, based on my experience with Intune, it, it can actually cut device preparation down by three hours per device. You know, when you think about all the different manual tasks and having to handhold users through setting up different things um, and freeing up, freeing up that kind of time per device is going to allow you to work on higher value tasks instead, right? And you know, for a lot of organizations that I work with, they want to get out of the business of, of managing servers. And ultimately, their end goal is to move away from MECM. Now, I know that's not necessarily for everyone, but anytime we can shut down some servers and simplify an architecture, it's going to make your job easier. And you know, for me, I'm all about working smarter, not harder, right? <laughs> um, and I guess the other piece on here, you know, Microsoft's done a really good job of building out the device management and security capabilities within Microsoft 365 so that they align with a zero trust architecture. Now, this enables us to effectively protect devices that are working outside of the network perimeter or you know, accessing different apps, data, and files across different cloud applications. Um, you know, maybe you have third-party products providing endpoint protection today, for example. Like that's okay as well. Microsoft does play well with those other vendors these days. And you know, sometimes it can all come together to provide a complete solution, although you're gonna get deeper integration, better visibility, and more control when you consolidate your tools into the Microsoft stack. So let's dive in and understand a bit more about Intune. So I'm gonna try and cover 
these three areas over the next few slides. Now, when it comes to modern endpoint management, Intune and Configuration Manager together offer a powerful comprehensive solution. When we align with a zero trust strategy using native tools like conditional access, every access request is fully authenticated, authorized and encrypted before we grant access. You know, in, in today's world where remote work and BYOD policies are increasingly more common, it is crucial that we protect both our apps and our devices um, using the, the granular controls that are offered by Intune and Configuration Manager combined. You know, we can actually ensure that sensitive data stays secure um, to ensure like a resilient workplace. Now, co-management allows us to maximize our existing investments into MECM, and it does that by letting us basically perform a, a phased cloud transition um, so that some workloads can be managed by Intune while others remain under the control of Configuration Manager. Now, I mentioned conditional access. It, it actually gives us controls that make automated access decisions in real time, and those are based on conditions such as the user's identity, the device, the device's health, um, the location it's coming in from, and you know any sort of perceived sign-in risk with the, the actual sign-in. And, and this is actually the heart of Microsoft's zero trust strategy. Now, let's not forget about the simplification of management workflows. So thanks to Intune's streamlined user interface and automated processes, tasks such as patch management or software distribution can be accomplished a lot more efficiently. And, and lastly, you know, it's essential to highlight that security measures extend to both managed and unmanaged devices and applications. So this ensures that, you know, we've got a secure environment, regardless of whether a device is owned by the school, an employee, or even a student. Um, you know, this comprehensive security approach aligns well with the realities of modern work. Now, Let's go into a little bit more detail um, on each of these three pillars. So unified management is key to support modern work. With Intune and Configuration Manager, we can manage and protect our devices better and easier. Cloud management has a lot of benefits. It's flexible and scalable. It actually reduces the need for hardware in some use cases and updates to our devices can be pushed automatically whether we're on or off the network. Business continuity is very important as well. You know, with more people working remotely, we need to ensure that they can access the things they need no matter where they are or what device they're using. Protecting devices is very important. You know, we need to protect all of our devices and you know, Intune and Configuration Manager combined can, can really do this, you know, as we start to move into this kind of modern way of hybrid working. Um, and the, the cool thing is we can actually manage both physical and virtual assets with these tools. Um, and let's kind of drill down and explore how it how it actually works. So Tenant Attach is a really useful feature. It connects our configuration manager on site to our cloud based Intune management. And this is really beneficial because it links on site devices to the cloud. It gives us a chance to start using cloud benefits, but keeps our on site setup. So if you look at the diagram, you can see that Tenant Attach lets devices managed by configuration manager enroll into Intune. So this basically means that you know we can see the devices in the Intune Admin Center, and we can also um, you know start some actions from the cloud, even if Configuration Manager partly manages the devices. And this is something that's enabled through co-management, um, which basically means that Windows 10 or Windows 11 devices can be managed by both Configuration Manager and Intune at the same time, 
And it really just gives us more flexibility and lets us move workloads to the cloud at a comfortable pace. And then, you know, looking towards the bottom of that, that diagram there, you know, when we move everything to the cloud, we use what's called cloud native management. And this is where Intune becomes our main management tool. And, you know, you might still use Configuration Manager sometimes for some use cases, but at this point, when you get that far, like if you're wanting to move away from Configuration Manager, then that's kind of when this happens. Um, I mean, overall, the good thing about Tenant Attach is the flexibility it gives you because you really can, you know, transition to Intune at a pace that works best for your organization. Now, let's talk about protecting data. You know, this is very important. It doesn't matter if devices are managed or unmanaged, if they belong to the company or they're personal. You know, we can protect all of these devices. And we get a lot of extra protection because in some cases, we're using Microsoft 365's apps and services, right? You know, they're natively part of Windows. And um, if you have a user whose computer fails, you can reset it and they would have immediate access back to their data with OneDrive. Now, I know we've got a lot of Google Workspace folks in the room, um, and, and it's kind of a similar model there, right? You know, as long as we're inserting the, the appropriate Google, Google Workspace stuff, Google Drive stuff in our deployment processes, then, um, you know, kind of same thing applies really. Um, now, we also have different options with remote support. So, You've got things like remote help in Intune, which we're going to be exploring more in a bit here, or quick assist, which is actually uh, built into Windows for remote support. And then my personal favorite, Windows Autopilot. So this is a way of provisioning devices over the air, right out of the box. Um, and we're going to be talking about this more later. Now, I mentioned earlier that we can manage virtual desktops and virtual machines with Intune. So Intune actually integrates with Windows 365 and Azure Virtual Desktop. Um, you can actually provision your Windows 365 machines straight out of Intune. It's really seamless. And you know you can align the configurations that you use on those devices to, to basically be quite similar to what you might want to use on your workstations. It just kind of it makes the whole thing a lot easier because you're not having to manage multiple sets of configurations if you don't need to. Um, and, you know, outside of the cloud ecosystem, if you've got, you know, Windows Server running Hyper-V or Hyper-V Server or even persistent virtual machines on ESXi, Engine can work with, with those as well, you know, for a virtual desktop use case for end users. Um, one of the kind of standout features of Intune is the use of cloud config. You know, it allows us to actually apply the same settings to Windows 10 and Windows 11 devices really quickly. And, you know, having consistent standardized configurations is really crucial when you're managing a wide range of devices. So I mentioned this earlier, remote help is basically a centralized secure support tool that's available in certain Intune licensing tiers. Um, and what's really great about remote help is the control that it gives administrators. They can determine who can assist which users and the level of permission granted. And, and that can be from view only to like full control. And, you know, suppose an action needs administrative rights. In that case, the help desk can use their credentials to execute it. Um, and moreover, if the user's device isn't compliant with our you know, security control standards, the, the system integrated with Microsoft 365 actually alerts the help desk to that. Um, after every remote help session, a detailed report's generated, and this helps us track or have an audit trail of what assistance was provided, you know, the time and the device involved. Um, and I guess one of the important aspects of this capability is the, the sort of like trust building feature that it has. So before connecting, users and the help desk can see each other's details and things like the profile picture, you know, the name of the school, um, title, and the domain name. And you know, in a world where we're kind of getting to a place where threat actors are trying anything to spoof and sneak their way in, 
Um, it's, it's quite valuable, actually. So let's now start to explore the the proactive protection capabilities within Intune. Now, regardless of whether data is being accessed from a managed or unmanaged device, we need to ensure that the appropriate guard rules are in place to, to protect it. With the help of Intune's integration with Azure AD and conditional access, um, we can actually set specific conditions to control access to the environment. So, for example, uh, we can define rules based on the location of access, you know, which device is being used, uh, the actual user state, or even like the sensitivity of the application being accessed. And, you know, if you look at this, this diagram here on the right, you'll see how these conditions work together to secure the data. Um, and, you know, to, to further ensure the environment safety, if you will, every device needs to meet our specific security and business requirements. You know, no device is going to get granted access unless it passes these requirements. And this just ensures that, you know, we keep the organization and data secure at all times. Um, I mean, like I mentioned before, this really is the core of, of Microsoft's zero trust architecture and um, conditional access. Now, no, knowing that, right, device compliance policies um, are, are rules that evaluate devices and determine if they do meet our security control standards. So we want to make sure that all our workstations, for example, have BitLocker enabled, the antivirus turned on, and maybe even verify that the operating systems at a certain update level. Um, these policies work hand in hand with conditional access and they give it the power to allow or block access to resources based on whether a device actually complies with the rules that we've set. Um, and what's great is, you know, the flexibility that we have when deploying these compliance policies. We can deploy them across the entire organization to all devices, or we can make them specific to certain platforms or, you know, user groups or devices. So it allows us to have like a, a tailored approach to device management and ensure that each device meets our, our specific requirements. So Intune has deep integration with other security tools within the Microsoft ecosystem. And, you know, it talks about preventive protection and in my language, I call that proactive security. And honestly, it, it's something that's often overlooked. Um, you know, a, a lot of times we'll go into an organization and, you know, they've got some sort of endpoint protection product, whether it's, you know, Defender, CrowdStrike, Sentinel-1, whatever, and, and that's kind of it. Um, and, you know, with what Intune gives us access to, we can use things such as um, Microsoft security baselines, um, and uh, other things like attack surface reduction rules. Th these are all kind of ready to go hardened settings that we can actually just apply to our devices and Intune, you know, with a few clicks. Um, and it really, really makes a difference for, for things that might be able to sneak their way around your, your endpoint protection tools. Um, outside of that, you know, we're talking Microsoft. So Defender for Endpoint, that's their Gartner Magic Quadrant leading endpoint detection and response capability. Um, it integrates with both Intune and conditional access. So, you know, if you had a situation where a device gets compromised, it's marked as non-compliant in Intune, and then that would actually restrict its access to sensitive data through conditional access until it's been remediated. And then, you know, the access would be allowed again. And the cool thing is, like, all of that can actually happen automatically without any input from you once you get it set up. So also with that same Defender for Endpoint integration, we get um, robust vulnerability management capabilities. Um, and, you know, these actually integrate so that, let, let's say, for example, you know, you're looking at the vulnerability management dashboard and you see in there that there's a vulnerable version of Chrome, for example, Chrome browser on your PCs. You know, it's been marked as critical. 
it's something you need to get sorted. You can actually hit a button that says request remediation and it will get passed through to a, a kind of ticket queue within Intune, a security tasks dashboard that folks can then pick up and, and work, right? They can fix it. And that can also integrate to your like primary ticketing system that you might use as well. Um, and, and it's really cool. I mean, these vulnerability management capabilities, they cover everything from like firmware firmware level vulnerabilities. So if anyone remembers the, the Spectre and Meltdown kind of CPU BIOS stuff that happened a few years back, um, you know, they'll pick up on operating system and um, network misconfigurations right the way through to even, you know, as I mentioned, software updates for third party applications. Um, and I guess one thing to note, um, you know, if you ended up with like bundled licensing where you have access to Defender, but you're using a third party endpoint protection product, um, I have a lot of customers that just stick Defender alongside that and it just kind of sits there passively and only does kind of the vulnerability management side of things. Um, so quite quite a good value add there. So now I'm going to kind of drill into some of the different capabilities that, that I think will uh, excite you the most. So the, the, really, this is the party piece of Intune for me anyway. You know, it, it, it's time to get out of the imaging game. Um, if you've ever worked with an MDM for deploying mobile phones, you'll be familiar with, you know, deploying applications and settings over the, the air, essentially, when the user turns on the device for the first time. And, and this is exactly how Windows Autopilot actually works. Um, so when you buy the devices from your, your vendor, um, they'll actually register them and push them into your, your Office 365 tenant so that they're there. Um, and then, you know, after you've kind of done all the configuration in the tenant, when the user receives the device and turns it on for the first time, um, it will get a deployment profile right from the out of box experience. So that thing that kind of first comes up as soon as you turn it on, and um, it stops them from signing into it with like a, you know, an account that's not their Office 365 account. Um, and, you know, once they authenticate, the device just automatically starts going through the process of provisioning over the air all the different applications and settings to get up and running quickly. Um, and I'm going to be demoing this capability to you today here as well. Um, so, yeah, we'll get into that here shortly. Now, some of you might use MECM to package and deploy applications today. Um, that function can be migrated to Intune, or if you're not doing that yet, then, you know, great, you can start with a clean slate here. Um, we can actually push applications from any vendor, uh, whether it's, you know, stuff out of the Windows Store, an EXE, an MSI, Apple iTunes Store, if we're talking mobile, um, you know, it's not a problem. We can even deploy the Office applications without the need for the Office Deployment Toolkit. And I'm sure some of you have had the pleasure of using that tool over the years. <laughs> so it's important to, you know, not only see that your devices are, are configured correctly, right, with those compliance policies that we talked about, but we want to also ensure that they're working correctly too. Um, Intune has a feature called Endpoint Analytics, and honestly, it's really awesome. So what it does is it gives us visibility into um, a lot of things like, you know, configuration issues within the environment that might be slowing down workstations and um, actual problems with the device itself. So, so for example, um, it'll call out old machines in the environment that have, or, or new machines if they've been misordered that have mechanical hard drives. Um, it will give you statistics to say, hey, you've got a problematic group policy that's slowing down the start time of the startup time of your PCs by this much. Um, and, you know, from a from a help desk perspective, it's really powerful. So let's say you know you've got a user that calls up, and they're they're reporting some sort of symptom. It's not really obvious what the root cause is. So if there's an application on the device that's like constantly hanging, you'll literally just be able to see it right there in Endpoint Analytics. Um, and my favorite one is it will show you the codes for blue screens. Um, and great example of this is T Tony that's there in the, the room with, with you guys today. He used to have this, this old Dell XPS laptop and 
Um, he had a lot. He had a lot of problems with it. You know, it was blue screening, it was rebooting, it was doing all sorts of crazy stuff. And I was able to just go in and look at it in Endpoint Analytics and literally just pull, in fact, see the blue screen code and understand that straight away that it was having a hardware failure. You know, I didn't have to mess around with getting on the device and pulling out blue screen readers and and that kind of thing. So, really, really powerful tool. Um, I guess one thing as well to add on that tool, they also now added a report that um, helps you understand your Windows 11 readiness too um, for all of the devices that you, you enroll with Windows 10. So that's really useful if you're you know, thinking about that over the next couple of years as we come at the end of life for Windows 10. Now, updates are probably one of the the biggest changes from MECM, kind of. Um, so traditionally with MECM, you had to push out each individual update as, you know, Windows updates could be kind of challenging, shall we say, in the past. Uh, things have come a long way since then. Um, you know, instead what we have now is Windows Update for Business, which essentially centralizes the management of Windows Update itself. Um, and it just kind of gives you really robust reporting. Um, I heard recently that MECM is actually adding this update method, but I don't think it's going to be implemented quite the same way. I think it's just generally pulling its patches from it instead of you know using WSUS and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, this this is the one that some some MECM kind of admins stop and pause and say, wait a minute, you're not letting me individually push my patches out anymore. And the answer is no, we don't we don't need to. It's come on a bit since. The old days of patches completely blowing things up all the time. Um, and actually, if you take advantage of the, the kind of higher Microsoft 365 licensing SKUs, then you get access to a feature called Windows Auto Patch. And it actually like completely outsources your patching to Microsoft. Um, so they'll automatically group your devices inside of Intune and they'll handle the rollout automatically. And they even monitor for any issues as the patches are hitting devices and they'll automatically pull back patches when problems are identified. And you know, behind the scenes, because it'll be across all of the different Microsoft organizations that have enrolled in this service, um, they'll bring in engineers to help kind of resolve and just fix bug issues. Um, so this is their kind of new approach to, to patching that's it, it's really useful if you want to get out of the patching game, like I'm sure a lot of you probably do. So, I'm going to kind of pause this here for a second, and I'm not sure what size of screen you're on in the in the room there, but basically this is just a little map that shows the different features that come in these kind of enterprise mobility and security tools, as they're called, um, across both the the A3 and A5 licensing SKUs. Uh, but we're we're going to follow up with these slides afterwards, though. So if you can't see it just now, don't worry on that one. Yeah, can you hear us? I can hear you. All right, perfect. Um, yeah, I was able to get out of my phone and disable all the settings that I had configured that prevented us from speaking earlier. I apologize. Yeah, th this one this one is a little small. Um, but if you want to highlight maybe some of some of the key features that you were talking about, um, also uh, I don't want to derail you, but we had some questions about how that updating works on the previous slide. But we can we can come back to those. Yeah, Tony, maybe um, capture out. I'll see if I can try and show. I haven't really got it turned on in the demo, that one. Um, yeah, we can come back to that towards the end. Um, okay. And I guess, you know, since folks are struggling to see this, um, I guess the key things I'd kind of shout out between the A3 and the A5. So a lot of the stuff that I've mentioned, you know, your compliance policies, um, but basic Windows update for business, um, conditional access, you know, all that kind of stuff that that is included in the A3. Um, the A5 just adds on the the more advanced security tools um, like Defender for Endpoint, the vulnerability management, that, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, they're they're bundling a lot of stuff in that that A5 licensing now, but you do still get a really good amount of capability in A3 to kind of you know get started on modernizing your device management. Now, uh, I guess in the theme of comparing things, um, you know, now that we've learned a little bit here about Intune, um, let, let's just sort of take a step back and I'll, I'll try and show you side by side, you know, 
a comparison of um, SCCM and Intune when you add it. So this is kind of what you would get out of a traditional um, MECM deployment on premise. Um, you know, basic device management, the ability to image stuff, the ability to manage updates, the inventory of hardware and software, that kind of thing. And then when we add in the Intune capability, you know, you get that, but then you get a lot more. <laughs> um, and the unified endpoint management, the, the ability to bring all your devices into the one place, you know, really, regardless of platform, I guess, excluding Chromebook, because that's not all the way there yet, but for all the other, you know, kind of mobile and desktop platforms, I mean, super powerful. And the, the additive security capabilities as well with things like conditional access and that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, it, it adds quite a bit of capability. And as I say, you know, it can be used as just a way to, to augment what you have. You know, it can be a stepping stone to get out of the server business kind of thing, or you've got a lot of options there. Um, so I, I think what I'll do now is I'm going to try and jump into a demo here. Um, and we're, we're recording this as well. So I'm going to try and describe as we're going through, since some folks might not be able to see the screen very well. Um, and then, you know, you can kind of watch this back later and ask any questions as well when we, we get to that point. Um, so let me stop sharing this presentation for a moment. And I'm going to try, first of all, share this browser here. Um, so Tony, I'll look for your thumbs up if you can see this. OK, you don't need to talk. It's fine. <laughs> I can kind of see you in the bottom right hand corner of my screen there. Um, OK, so um, this is Microsoft Intune. Um, and what we're going to do in this little demo here is go through the process of trying to provision an autopilot device. I've got a Windows 11 virtual machine kind of primed and ready. And I'm going to show you like actually doing some of these different configurations that I've, that I've talked about. Um, so first of all, just to sort of um, just to show you where we're starting here, if I go to Windows and Windows enrollment underneath Windows autopilot deployment program, I'm going to click into devices. So this is where your autopilot devices would get pushed into um, when you buy them from your your manufacturer. And also, like as you start to register your devices in Intune, you know, through the co-management, you can actually kind of set it so that they, they can be enrolled to autopilot, you know, for, for future purposes kind of thing. Um, but what, what I've done here is I've just manually um, added this virtual machine device so that it's registered with the autopilot service. Um, and the other thing that I did is a bit of pre-work because it takes a little bit of time to sink in is um, I created a new group. I'm going to show you this. So, oh, no, not that one. Um, I just called it autopilot devices. Um, and, you know, this is quite a, a good practice when you start doing autopilot. Um, so this is actually a, a dynamic group. And what we've done is we've put a rule on this dynamic group that says, hey, any device <coughs> That has an ID that's that contains ZTD ID, which basically means zero touch device ID. It's an identifier that all those ones that get pushed into that previous screen end up with. Um, add it to this group. So if I look at the membership of the group, we we can see that we've got our, our device we saw previously. And what happens is after we actually enroll it, this name will get updated um, and it'll be like a real Azure AD joined machine. Um, and you know, there's a a few different ways to kind of approach this stuff, but um, I just want to sort of give you an idea and then, you know, we can take questions at the end for, hey, how does hybrid Azure AD join fit into this and stuff like that? Um, okay, so device is in there already. Um, so typically at that point, what I would do is go into my enroll devices again, and I would create a, a, an autopilot deployment profile. Um, and basically what this does is it tells the the device what 
what to do, right? When it's going through the out-of-box experience and it, and it pulls this down from Intune. Um, and in this case, I've just set it up to keep it real simple for this demo. The device will be Azure AD joined. Um, I told it I want it to be an administrator account when, I'm, when I actually get onto it, but um, the default for this is standard user. Um, I just did that you know, for the demo in case I want to do anything on that device later. And then I gave it a naming convention as well. Um, so like a company name with a four digit random number at the end of it. Um, and we assigned that to our autopilot devices group. Um, so I did that in advance because it actually does take like five, 10, 15 minutes for that to sort of sink in. Um, and nobody's got time to sit and watch that, that doing its thing at this end here. Um, the one other thing that I did is I set this thing called the enrollment status page. And we're actually going to see that in action when when we go through autopilot on this virtual machine here. So the, basically what this is, is a really cool feature. So for those of you that have ever, you know, built out task sequences and stuff like that over the years, you know, sometimes what happens is you need to do stuff when the device is actually in Windows deploying certain things and whatever. And you can kind of end up with a situation where, you know, the device is at the desktop and the user's like clicking X on everything um, to try and get on with whatever they're wanting to do. Um, and that's why, you know, that model typically doesn't work for a sort of self-service getting up and running model. Um, so this enrollment status page just basically stops them messing around with the computer until it's finished going through the deployment process. Um, and it kind of shows them the status as it's running through. So it, this is just some basic configuration to, to turn that on there. Um, the, the last thing, I guess, that I'll, I'll show you in this, this section before we start doing some configuration is um, the automatic enrollment scope. Um, so let's say in your environment, you're so there's there's two ways you can do this, right? We talked about tenant attach and having um, MECM pushing the devices in here. That's one model. The other model is, you know, maybe we are doing devices that are purely joined to Azure AD, um, and a little bit later in that deployment process, uh, you know, because they're coming in from the internet, maybe we want Intune to actually install the MECM agent on them so that it kind of gets the engine first and then goes into configuration manager, you know, if you're trying to do co-management that way. Um, so whatever way you go with that, there's this enrollment scope option here. And basically what we're saying is, hey, um, for anything that comes in from um, Azure Active Directory or anything that comes into Azure Active Directory, allow it to automatically um, enroll into engine. So at a basic level, that covers like some of the nuts and bolts to to actually get something in here. Now, before I go to that device, I think what we'll do is we'll start to do some of the different configuration types um, that I would recommend is like, here's how you start, you know, configuring a golden configuration. So um, maybe should have had a slide on this, but when you approach actually building out configuration and engine, the kind of best practice is to start off with security baselines that we're going to be looking at in a moment. Uh, then from there, once you have those in place, um, start to create things like, you know, device restrictions, um, specific device configurations. And then from there, you can start to go down into um, important group policy, believe it or not. Um, so there are ways to analyze your on-premise group policies and port those over to Intune. There's a group policy analytics tool um, that's within here. Um, it's here. <laughs> and basically, what you do is you go into group policy and you can export a policy as an XML file and then import it in here. And this tool will actually tell you, you know, how much of it can just be ported over. And then once you have kind of all your sort of configurations in place um, and you know maybe some applications layered in too and you're happy that's when we do our compliance policies you know at the end that, that are the sort of check and balance to make sure that um, everything is set up appropriately so let, let's kind of just actually show you some of those things because you know pictures a thousand words and all that so in this endpoint security section first of all you know we've got a lot of different options but I'm going to hone in on the security baselines here um, 
and you'll see there's actually a variety of them. And this this is hot off the press. They've actually just this month, well, I guess last month now, added security baselines, so hardening settings for the Microsoft Office apps themselves. Um, so that's definitely something to look at. But for just now, we're just going to create one here for our Windows 11. So we'll say Windows 11 security baseline. And there's a lot of different things that are in here that are the kind of best practice hardening settings. Now, most of the time you can get away with just turning all of them on without a whole lot of um, fallout. But in our education customers, there are usually a couple of things. Well, one, one major thing actually that I usually tell them to look out for. There is this thing here called DMA Guard. And basically what it does is if you have any like obscure pieces of equipment, so I'm thinking about stuff in labs that are maybe used for hardware development or, you know, industrial applications or just just any kind of obscure pieces of hardware that that plug in my USB and likely have interest in drivers it's very likely that this setting is going to block them. Um, so that one I would maybe put to not configured if you have a scenario like that. The other thing to look out for, and I'm going to have to say this maybe, um, is firewall stuff. If you're ever applying these security baselines to a virtual machine, you're going to want to make sure that you turn off the block all the inbound connections option here. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to actually remote desktop into it. Um, now, best practice would be then to kind of go on and probably tune firewall rules to, you know, make it somewhat restrictive and just allow the stuff that's needed like 3389 and whatever else for your remote desktop. Um, but yeah, lo lots of things in here. Um, I'm actually going to turn off BitLocker too because it's a virtual machine and doesn't have it. Um, so scope tags, just a quick word on those. You're going to see them all over the place. So this is part of Intune's role-based access control. Um, so let's imagine uh, you're a, you know, a larger school or university and you've got a lot of departments that maybe have um, IT folks in them that want to manage their own stuff. Um, so essentially with scope tags, you could have a tag for each of those different sort of departments within the school and the tag would be assigned to a group and the group would also be assigned an admin permission. And the idea is that you use the kind of overarching service manager, if you like, would be able to tag devices that are going to be you know, owned by that department. And then the individual in that department, when they come in here, because they're in the group with the tag associated with it, would only be able to see their stuff. Um, so, you know, some folks might have a use case for that. If you don't, then just just ignore it. And then on the ass assignment side of things, you'll see that we always have included groups and excluded groups. Um, in this case, we're going to include an Intune users group that I've put some test users in. Um, but, you know, if you had a group of a lot of folks in it, um, you could pick the, the excluded groups option just to kind of, you know, pull the executives out of the big group or whatever it is. And then we can review there and just kind of create. OK, so we've got our security baseline created. Um, so the next thing that we'll do is I'll show you some configuration profiles. So I'm going to come back into Windows. I'm going to go to configuration profiles. And a couple of interesting things to note here. Um, so we're about to do this, but eagle eyed folks might notice there's a, a tab here that says import ADMX. Um, so in addition to like being able to port over group policy settings, if you've got a group policy that's actually been supplied to you by a vendor. So I think the last one of these I did was maybe like a Cisco one or something. Cisco had a custom ADMX file that traditionally you would import in a group policy on your domain controllers, and then you'd be able to set certain Cisco settings or whatever. So this basically just gives you the ability to import those whole uh, custom, you know, third party group policy files into Intune and use them. Um, but yeah, for us, we're coming in here. We're selecting a Windows 10 and later profile, and we're going to jump into 
settings templates. Lots of different templates to pick from. Um, and for this example, I'm going to use a device restrictions one. So what they've done is they basically um, tried to group together the settings and the kind of logical templates, if you will, so that you know device, device restrictions is going to have things like uh, blocking USB access and, and stuff like that. Um, so if I just say Windows 11 device restrictions, um, and again, you know, lots of different things to to kind of um, configure here. Um, and just to show you, you know, it can be things from like, hey, I want to lock and set what the start menu layout looks like, all the way down to things like, um, let me see, I want to block Cortana because she's kind of annoying. I think we're winning on that one though, because I saw that they're actually going to be removing it in the next Windows update. They're killing it off. Um, or, you know, maybe I want to block the ability for a user to end processes from the task manager. I mean, there's a lot of granularity that you can get into here, even down to like, you know, battery settings and, um, you know, printers, all sorts of stuff. You know, what what happens when the user is at the lock screen, um, you know, lots of different kind of options in here, but we'll, we'll kind of keep it simple just now, I think. Um, I'll block the gaming capabilities as well, I think. So we're blocking the access to the gaming settings and the settings app. And again, I'm going to make this available for or assign it to our Inchin users group. And uh, some settings have like this applicability rules option, and it's more so you can get like a little bit more granular and say, you know, I want to assign it if the OS edition is you know windows 11 education because that's what all the students have but we're using i don't know windows 11 pro for staff so we don't want to do it to them and um, honestly not something i use very often i tend to rely on my actual azure ad groups for for that side of things and um, we'll create that policy there um i'm gonna do another configuration profile i think before I move on, because there is one that is usually quite valuable for folks. Um, so, just like in group policy, we have administrative templates. So this is going to look quite familiar when we get in here. And I'm actually going to create one for, um, I guess I'll do one for OneDrive just as an example. Um, but as you can see, you know, we got a lot of stuff in here and it is literally the port over of the administrative templates from um, group policy and you even got some Google Chrome stuff in here. But just for argument's sake, I'm just going to say. Um, let me see. I'm going to go with silently sign in users. So silently sign users into the OneDrive sync app with their Windows credentials. Um, I'm just going to pick that one for this example. And um, but you know, there's a variety of reasons that you might want to come in there and use some of those admin templates, I'm sure. Um, and we'll assign that to the the Intune users group. Um, so you know, Microsoft's done a really good job of basically trying to pour everything over that you would do in group policy um through this capability now outside of configuration profiles um applications are, are probably a really important thing to look at and just as a side while i'm in here um you'll see we have the ability to actually push powershell scripts too um you can just push them straight from here and they'll run on the device you can have them run as a local user or as the system um, and we'll come back to this update stuff in a minute OK, so when it comes to application deployment, you know, we support a few different platforms here. Um, we're just going to focus on Windows for just now, because I think that's kind of the, the hot button for the group. And um, we've got a variety of different options. So there's the, the Microsoft Store, 
um, you're going to want to select the new option because this legacy one's about to be dead. Um, you know, the Microsoft 365 apps um, and the stuff that you'll probably do more often down at the bottom here, we've got line of business apps as well as Win32 apps. So line of business apps actually allow you um, to directly upload an MSI into the web browser. So let me just show you that. I have one. Just a random Microsoft installer here. So I've picked my MSI file. And it's automatically pulled out of it, you know, a lot of information about the app. And we're going to see the company portal in a little bit here. So for those of you that use it, a company portal is basically a cross-platform version of Software Center. Um, so it's what Intune uses instead of Software Center. Um, now for this application, I think I'm just going to tell it to push it. So when we're deploying an app, we've got three different options, um, required, available, or uninstall. Um, required means it gets forced. Available means it just shows up in the, the company portal. Um, so in this case, I'm going to make this um, Azure Info Information Protection app um, force push to our Intune users group. And you know you can do to user groups or or device groups as well. So let me just add that there. And what you'll see in a second is it pops up in the top telling us that it's actually uploading the application into Intune. Um, but we can keep going while it's working there behind the scenes. So let's add another application now. Um, and I'll actually, I'm actually going to show you a trick here too. So we're going to add a couple of the Microsoft Store apps. And you'll be thinking to yourself, why on earth would I want to use anything out of the Microsoft Store? But there's actually some really good use cases. So first of all, the, the company portal app, it gets deployed from there. Um, and really the, the key use case for those that haven't like used Software Center or anything like that is if you want users to be able to sort of self-service install applications that you don't want to push to everyone's device um, without needing any local administrator permissions, then you know this is the way to kind of achieve that. Um, and I am going to require this for all devices, actually. Now, I know I'm kind of going a little bit quicker. I'm just conscious of time here. Um, I'm going to now show you another use for the Microsoft Store stuff that's kind of like one of my life hacks. So if we go back to Microsoft Store app, and let's this time select Xbox Game Bar. This could, and we could be searching for Paint 3D. We could be searching for any of those kind of bloatware applications that that tend to come on Windows. Um, that usually someone has to manage a PowerShell script to try and get rid of them. That <laughs> this is just a an easy button. So Xbox Game Bar, I want that to be uninstalled on all devices, and and that's it. There's no managing PowerShell scripts or anything like that. It just it just kind of makes that a lot easier. And um, so that's my usual trick that I use with a lot of customers these days. Um, so other things to note. We've looked at MSIs. We've looked at the store apps. Um, what about what about things that are not an MSI? You know, some of you are going to have uh, standalone executables that you want to package in here. You know, maybe you've got um, in applications that need things customized when they're installed, like registry changes, you know, files and folders edited, whatever it is. Um, so the the Win32 option is the one to go for in that scenario. And the way that that one works is Microsoft has this little packaging tool. It's just a little command line tool. And essentially what you do is you, you put all the files for the application in you know, a folder locally on your PC, a working folder. Um, and you know if, if you want to do a whole bunch of customization when this thing installs, you can actually create a, a batch script or a PowerShell script and stick it in the same folder. And then this tool 
we'll package it all together as a dot Intune win file. And then you can just take that and upload it through that Win32 option in here. And as you're kind of you know clicking through the the wizard for that, because I don't really have an example, um, it will ask you for things like what is the installation command? You know, and that's when you can tell it to call your PowerShell or your batch script or, or just an executable with a bunch of switches on it, right? And then you know it'll ask you for the uninstall command. It'll ask you to um, how how it should detect the detection rules to tell whether it's installed. And um, so uh, you know all those kind of options to really support you packaging up everything. I mean, I've even done this for packaging up VPN profiles to push out and just had a script that copies them to the appropriate place on the hard drive. So you can get quite creative with this stuff. Um, it's definitely quite powerful. So I'm going to show just a few more configurations and then we're actually going to flip to this virtual machine and see if through the magic of software it works for us because <laughs> you know how these demos can go sometimes right but um i've got hope <laughs> so when i think about some of the the other security centric options you know one of the things that's getting a lot of traction at the moment is passwordless and you know we're seeing a lot of devices that are are being delivered with windows hello enabled uh, cameras built into them so Really simple. Um, we can create a profile either in here or if we wanted it to be something that was, you know, for individual users, there is actually an option inside of the configuration profiles too, where we can say, hey, I want to enable it or disable it. Um, and, you know, it then gives you a lot of granular control around um, the pin number because generally the pin number is used as a backup for Windows Hello. Um, you know, some folks I work with, they want it completely off, they don't want anything to do with it. Others do want to use it. And um, the thing I would say to note is if you decide to use Windows Hello for business, um, there is actually a bit of an infrastructure component for it. So if you've got folks inside the local network, um, you know, that are using this feature, you, you need to, there, there's like some configuration required on prem. Otherwise, the domain controllers kind of get in the way of the authentication and it can cause this kind of like, continual pop up asking for user credentials. Um, so that's just it's something to keep in mind. And you know, if anyone wants to know more about that, let us know at the end and we can send out um, an article that explains more on that one. Um, so outside of that, we're going to run across and look at those update rings that we skipped over a minute ago. So update rings uh, for Windows 10, Windows 11. This is basically the um, Windows update for business that I mentioned. If it'll load, hang on. Here we go. Now, the kind of best practice with this is, in my mind, to have two of these at least. One that's like getting the updates, as, you know, as soon as they're released, um, and then a second one that's maybe got like a 30-day lag. Um, so that you've got time to kind of troubleshoot any issues and just test everything out before it goes to to the mass population kind of thing. Uh, but I'm just going to create one for the demonstration here. So we've got a lot a lot of different options. I mean, we can get granular around, you know, deferral periods, uh, which kind of goes back to what I was talking about, how you can space those rings out. Um, this is kind of the, the big one in here. So this yes, no switch is basically the best practice for upgrading your devices to Windows 11 using Intune. It's recommended that you do it through these update rings. Um, and actually, it, it does work really well. <laughs> I, I did this to Tony when Windows 11 first kind of came out. Um, and it was like he went away, he went away for lunch, came back and then asked me why his start menu was in the middle of the screen. So it does work pretty well. <laughs> um, you know, beyond that too, we can control that that sort of maintenance window when we want the updates to to apply, like the the level of notification the user gets, and even deadline settings to say, you know, do we want to give them a grace period? How long before we just automatically force a reboot? Because you always get that one user that like stretches out as far as they can and never reboots their machine. But 
you know, we're patching vulnerabilities, so we have to kind of draw a line in the sand somewhere. Um, so yeah, you know, lots of customization there. And then, you know, you can choose to assign, again, assign it to certain groups and, and exclude others on that one. Um, and I guess the last piece of configuration I'm going to show you before we flip across to our device is the compliance policies that I mentioned earlier. So we're going to create a compliance policy for our Windows 10 and later devices. And I'm not going to name it after myself. I'm going to call it Windows 11 compliance policy. So quite a few different options in here. Um, as you can see. And you'll notice that there's even some tiebacks to configuration manager compliance if you if you ever used that. Um, but yeah, typically you're going to want to think about at the minimum requiring BitLocker. Um, if your devices have it secure, but although it's not unheard of for that to be disabled on stuff when it's delivered from the factory, but basically this is a really good pre-boot security feature that stops malware from like attaching itself and um, you know, like root kits from attaching the you know themselves to some of those preboot areas on the device um and like other things you might want to apply as well um you know make sure the firewall's on the tpm's enabled antivirus anti-spyware that kind of thing um now i have one education customer down here in Atlanta who Wanted to be very specific and look for things like ensure qualis agents installed on the device and um, that we have a terms of use set for the login screen and stuff like that. So you can actually build custom compliance scripts uh, to look for literally anything you want on the device. So sky's kind of the limit with the configuration of this stuff. Um, as for the actions for non-compliance, you can actually give them a grace period. So, you know, let's say we wanted to give them 30 days to fix their stuff, right? And maybe we want to immediately send an email to the user. Um, and I don't know that I've got any message templates set in this tenant, um, but there's another section where you can build like different templates for messaging for this purpose. Um, and, you know, it could be instructions for what they have to do to make their device compliant and, you know, have that countdown until they hit the 30 days when it goes non compliant. Um, or, you know, you can just have it do it immediately. That's an option too. Um, and again, this can be applied to devices. It can be applied to users. We've got the flexibility to go both ways there. Um, and of course, you know, we can do it for, for all the different sort of platforms that are supported. Um, now, I, I'm going to point to it, but you'll notice Chrome OS is a preview option on here. I think at the moment, um, a lot of it's around the compliance side of things. Um, but Microsoft is, I guess, starting to build that because they're trying to unify this for everyone. But um, yeah, maybe something to explore if you're if you're curious on that one. Um, OK, so we've set up a bunch of stuff. Let's now um, see, see if we can see some of it in action. So let me stop sharing this screen and I'm going to start sharing um, another view here. This one. Oh, already. So what we've got here is a Windows 11 virtual machine. This is the one that was already kind of enrolled in autopilot just to kind of speed things up for us. And, and literally what I've done is I've turned it on. <laughs> I've turned it on. It's looked at the Internet. It knows it's an autopilot. So it's immediately asking me to to set things up for work or school. And since we've got these like horrible usernames, I kind of pre typed it uh, and we're going to try and sign in as Alan here. And let's see if I can type in Alan's password because I have no way to copy and paste it. So bear with me while I hopefully don't fail miserably to put this in. Oh, 
just be signing again. I have left this machine sitting like this for a good hour, so we might have to restart it. We'll see. Because obviously, typically, you just kind of boot it up and go. There we go. Yeah, I've been sitting for like quite a while before we started. Um, so in theory, what we're doing now is we've signed in, it's doing its authentication and it's starting to kind of actually look at those different things that are scoped to the Intune users group that Alan is a part of. Um, and we'll, we won't stare at this for too long. We might come back to it because I've got some more slides to, to kind of talk through on, you know, best practices for doing this stuff, but we'll give it a second here and see if it goes to the deployment status page or not. Um, and if not, we'll, we'll pivot back to it towards the end to see the, the finished result. And as all things do in the world of live demos, um, we've got an error. <laughs> Not sure why that is. I may have to look on the test tenant and see. Um, think, think, think. Let me try signing in once more. And then I'll keep an eye on it on the side. Okay, what we'll do is while that's cooking, we'll um, jump back into the slides here. I'll keep an eye on it on the side. So let me quickly reshare that. So we'll get through this last section here um, and then we'll be able to do questions and see what's going on with that that virtual machine all right so um hopefully that at least gave you kind of a, a taste of you know how this engine stuff can come together let's now kind of walk through some of the, the best practices for for deploying Intune. now understanding you know current state first of all is very important you know you need to to think about how you would structure your mdm migration um you know do you want to build it out build out policies and apps that maybe align with different departments or you know how, how do you want that to look um and then is your goal to simply augment your existing MECM infrastructure so that you can you know add these modern management capabilities or is is co-management like a, an intermediate step for you so that you can go to a full migration and you know when we think about the the migration criteria um, do you want to have all the staff set up like with autopilot devices, but you know maybe keep PC labs or anything like that as as kind of a network pixie boot image, just because because you you're slapping them on there with Ghost or something like that. Uh, and and then what about your mobile devices, right? Um, and you know beyond that, like from a process perspective, um, you know. Can you simply just onboard your existing devices through tenant attach? Or if you're not really using MECM like that way or that heavily, does it make more sense to do a, a hybrid Azure AD join 
and then rely on group policy to, to enroll your devices. You know, lots of different questions to ask as you start to think about designing that plan. Um, and then, you know, there's also an approach to think about of, do we just draw a line in the sand and say anything bought beyond this point is going to be an autopilot device um, and we'll just slowly, um, you know, age out our old SCCM devices. Um, so definitely those are the types of questions I'd be asking as you start to bring together your plan. And, you know, we've talked about the, the different types of devices that you can manage with Intune. Um, you know, you've got your company managed devices. Um, these might be dedicated to a specific user or, you know, they might be shared across multiple users. Um, you know, you've also got devices that are, or well, I guess we would call employee managed. So, you know, it's either their primary device um, or what I would call like a companion device. So something that they use to get online from time to time, like a student's iPad or a family computer. Um, and then last but not least, right, you've got third party managed devices. So um, devices that might be managed by other entities or perhaps, you know, you're just not familiar with them. Things like partners or contractors or or even public kiosk type scenarios. Um, you know, big thing to note is that Intune can handle all of those use cases. So this is just a kind of view that shows the recommended approach for migrating any Android devices into Intune. Um, and, you know, for most use cases, it's just a case of unenrolling from the old MDM and re-enrolling into Intune. And this is the same view for Apple. So ADE is the, the automated device enrollment capability that integrates with Intune from Apple School Manager. Um, there are some use cases where devices will need to reset into Intune, but really for personally owned devices, they just need unenrolled and re-enrolled. Um, there is actually a management mode that's not mentioned in here where we can just manage the Microsoft applications on a user's device, sorry, like a mobile device, iPhone, Android, um, and you don't actually have to manage the, the device itself. It purely is a case of they sign into the, the Office apps on the phone, and then it kind of gets this encrypted container wrapped around it that lets you control what's going on in the app itself. And that could be quite a good one if you're trying to handle, um, you know, personal device usage and securing data, um, but also are getting a lot of pushback about folks not wanting you to install stuff on their devices. And it's called an app protection policy. So that's another good one to, to think of. Um, so this, this little kind of um, template here, um, good little sort of document to help you document your migration criteria, right? What we're going to move in as part of the project. And we're going to send this stuff out afterwards. You know, there's a few templates here that would be kind of useful to help you build your plan. And then beyond that, you know, Having a well-defined migration strategy and communication plan can can really make or break an intune migration. So I'm going to show you some of the different like approaches that you can take. Now, from a mobile device perspective, there are some third-party tools to aid the migration, but really the, the scenarios you saw in those Apple and Android slides still apply. Uh, you know, if an iPhone is supervised by another MDM, it's going to need reset. These tools just kind of give you some extra structure and reporting capabilities for, for unenrolling and, and re-enrolling users. Um, and honestly, I'm working with a, a large customer just now to kind of do one of these migrations and they're, they're just wrapping some good process around it rather than using a third party tool. Um, now, the, the approach we normally take is a blend of kind of custom tailored scripts and, you know, processes. Um, and whilst we see similarities in a lot of Intune migrations, different customers definitely have different needs. Um, so for example, I've had to develop scripts before to migrate a workstation from being like purely domain joined to completely Azure AD joined uh, in a way that avoids like having to wipe and load it, you know, so scripts to help migrate the user profile and that kind of thing. But what I would say is, you know, don't feel like you have to invest in building specialist tools to perform your migration. Um, so one that I'm on just now, I'm working with a 10,000 user organization and we're using, you know, co-management and all the other built-in capabilities fine to move stuff over. Um, so yeah, 100%, you know, these tools work well with what's natively in them. 
Now, project management is really important, especially when you know you're doing a larger migration. Uh, and, and once you know what you're trying to achieve as the end goal, you can start to document the steps on how to get there. And, and honestly, you'll be surprised. Uh, you know, different things definitely come to mind when you do this as an exercise. Things that like you might otherwise only discover when you're when you're knee deep in the work. Um, and when I'm doing one of these, you know, I take a three phased approach. So from like a high level, I'll have a proof of concept phase with um, some different sort of phases underneath it, um, a production pilot, and then scaling up to full production. Um, and to kind of help you see what that might look like, here's another little sort of template plan that you, you can use to, to help with your, your migration. Um, now, Microsoft's published some great materials to kind of make building a communication plan around your, your migration strategy a lot easier. Um, so there's a link here that takes you off to a site where you can kind of grab those templates. Um, so again, we'll, we'll send these out after. So I guess lastly here on this part, to take advantage of like all of these security features that I've talked about, um, conditional access definitely helps a lot. So two different use cases from mobile devices, whether or not you're fully managing them in tune, and in tune, um, you know, I recommend standardizing your users as far as you can with the Office 365 apps and um, like, you know, Outlook instead of Apple Mail, for example, it just gives you much more control over the, the sensitive data on the device. Uh, so for example, it ensures that, you know, someone can't copy sensitive HR or finance information from Outlook into WhatsApp, right? Um, and this will also help you be compliant with a lot of the, the new NIST requirements that are coming down from the government. Um, and additionally, you know, conditional access can help drive adoption by blocking access to Windows PCs that are not managed by Intune. And that, I guess, in itself can solve a few different problems. <laughs> um, and to kind of wrap it up here, um, the last area I'd recommend tackling is hands-on training to actually help jumpstart your proof of concept. So we deliver immersive in-depth workshops that are actually hands-on with these tools in your environment. Uh, they cover a number of areas, uh, insured included, and th the best bit is they're actually fully funded by Microsoft, so they're zero cost to you. Um, typically, we'd work with your team over one or two hour long sessions over several weeks to set up these tools in a workshop mode, you know, over a team session like this with you driving. And then at the end of the day, like you can literally take that configuration we've built out and like scale it up and use it for your deployment and add to it. Um, you know, we deep dive into the areas that are important to you and, and we tailor the sessions to where you are in your journey right now um, and fit it all around your schedule. Um, if you're kind of looking at this engine stuff and are feeling like you could do with that sort of help and it'd be valuable, um, well, let Tony know at the end of the session today or or drop us an email. I mean, we're going to follow up with the slides, um, so you can always let us know then too. Um, we've also recorded this, so I'm sure we'll be sending out a, a link to the recording as well.